Audiobook Academy. Book Summary. The Good Earth. By A. Pearl S. Buck. Authored by Pearl S. Buck, The Good Earth was first published in 1931. The novel was an instant hit, and the following year, in 1932, it won the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction. There's no doubt that this book helped Pearl S. Buck win the Nobel Prize for Literature that year, as it was the most popular book in the United States for two years running, 1931 to 1932. There are three books in this series. It is titled Sons and a House Divided in the second and final books of the trilogy. Wang Long, a poor Chinese farmer living in the country just before World War I, is the focus of the story. An estate slave girl is his wife at the start of this novel. Wang Lung raises a family with his wife, Olan, and faces many challenges and successes along the way. He begins as a poor guy, but thanks to his farm and some good fortune, he becomes one of the country's wealthiest landowners and fathers many children. Even after the death of his wife and the birth of his children, Wang Lung continues to live a long life. After Wang Lung's death, his children begin to rebel against the life he had planned for them and decide that they do not want to be farmers and that they mean to sell the land he has worked all his life for when they grow up. A developing, changing Chinese society is represented by Wang Lung's children and their wives. If he doesn't adapt, he will be left behind. Wang Lung, an impoverished farmer in rural China, reaches marriageable age in the novel's opening scenes. When trying to select Wang Lung's future wife, his father insists that she be unattractive fearing that if she is attractive, she will lose her virginity sooner rather than later. However, Wang Lung believes that he won't be able to find his new bride beautiful. This guy wants to get married to someone who makes him smile. At the absolute least, he wants her to be free of blemishes and split lips. Wang Lung travels from the farm where he lives with his father to the palatial estate of the late Lord Hu Wang. Olan, a slave owned by the affluent family, is his wife. Because of her height and physique, Wang Lung is taken aback by Olan, but she is much more so because she is dark-skinned and her feet are unbound. During a famine year, Wang Lung's family purchased Olan from the old mistress of the home. She goes on to say that she thinks Olan is still a virgin, which is a bold claim to make. The elderly mistress asks Olan to bring their first child to see her before the pair departs together. As they make their way back to their home, the newlyweds stop at a little earth temple on Wang Lung's property such to commemorate their union. Wang Lung's father protests about the cost of their wedding feast, but Wang Lung knows that the elder man is secretly pleased to have visitors on a good occasion. Wang Lung. He agrees to cook, but he won't see any other guys until after they've finished their marriage. Wang Lung appreciates her modesty and culinary skills. As Wang Lung wakes up the next morning, Olan serves him a cup of tea, which makes him grateful. He is overjoyed because she appears to appreciate and respect him. So begins their journey as a couple. Prosperous times lie ahead. Olan gives birth to the couple's first son and heir while they work hard in the fields. The crops are good, and the family is able to live a reasonably priced yet happy existence. Olan returns to Huang's big home after a period of time to show off her healthy child to her previous lords. She observes that things are tough for the Huangs and informs her husband of this. Some of the land that the Huangs are selling off is purchased by Wang Lung. O former land slave family had owned this land, thus it brings him great joy to be able to claim it as his own. Prosperity lasts for a while, and O Lan has another child. Although the good times are short-lived, as a gesture of respect for his family, Wang Lung offers his shiftless uncle some money. There follows a birth of O first Lan's child. Having a child with a slave, as women were then termed in China, is a sign of bad luck for Wang Lung. Shortly thereafter, a prolonged dry spell begins. Wang Lung purchases additional Huang property in its initial few months, despite the warnings of impending hardship. Having land does not alleviate the family's plight when they, like their neighbors, go hungry. Wang Lung glances at the Temple of the Earth with scorn one day as he goes by. He no longer cares about the gods. It is Wang Lung's uncle who propagates the rumors that Wang Lung is secretly stockpiling food. They break into Wang Lung's residence in order to steal the few sacks of beans and maize that he has left. Ching, a poor but honest man who only joins in the raid to feed his child, appears at this point in the narrative. In light of their predicament, Wang Lung determines that he and his family must depart for the city as soon as Olan, who is pregnant for the second time, gives birth. She goes to bed alone one night and gives birth to her child. Olan informs Wang Lung that it was a girl who was born dead when he inquires about it. She may have killed the undesired child, as evidence suggests. While Olan was still recovering from the birth, the family left Wang Lung's property in search of food and job. 
Once at Kyungsoo City, they take a fire wagon, a special type of freight train. Upon arriving at the house, they erected an impoverished shack against the wall. Their lives are difficult. With Alan and the sons begging on the streets, Wang Lung must work long hours to support his family. Wang Lung discovers unexpected truths about Chinese society after he arrives in the big metropolis. He picks up a female passenger from another country one day. He has always considered himself a country bumpkin and an outsider in the city, but on this occasion he sees himself through the eyes of a true foreigner and recognizes his kinship with all of his fellow countrymen as a true foreigner does. Angry city inhabitants also teach Wang Lung about economic inequality, he learns from them. Even though he doesn't fully grasp the concept, he's told that his hunger is caused by the rich who are too rich. Several months of hard living go by. Rumors of war and reports of an advancing enemy spark turmoil in the city one day. A financial crisis may be brewing, as seen by the wealthy abandoning the city. A huge ruckus finally breaks out. The city gates have been breached by the enemy. It is Ojoblands to help the petty thieves break into the opulent house, which is erected against the walls of their squalid dwellings. Wang Lung continues to follow, but he is unable to accept anything. A obese affluent man has been left behind in the mansion he enters. The man offers Wang Lung a large sum of silver in exchange for Wang Lung not killing him. Wang Lung and his family return to their ancestral home with this money. Wang Lung returns to his farm after using the money to buy seeds and tools. He goes to the temple of the ground once more to pray for good fortune. Once again, Olen is in charge of the affairs of the family. Their fortunes continue to rise as a result of an unexpected turn of events. Wang Lung discovers that Olan stole gems from a mansion in the city and has a secret cache of them. With only two pearls to hold on to now, he snatches them all away from her. He returns to the Huang residence, which has been abandoned, armed with his newfound loot. Besides the old lord and a slave, the only survivors are Cuckoo, the former concubine of the old lord. Wang Lung trades the diamonds for a swath of land that he intends to develop. Now he's working even harder, and he's enlisting the support of Qing. Wang Lung discovers that his first daughter is intellectually disabled around this period. He speculates that she's simply had enough of their trials and tribulations in the past. However, things are going well in the here and now. After seven years of excellent fortune, Olan gives birth to healthy twins, a boy and a girl. Wang Lung's fortune has grown considerably. He's starting to move up the social ladder. For example, he is now able to send his two oldest sons to school because he has always been humiliated of his own inability to read. Wang Lung's land can't be planted during a terrible season. He has nothing to do for the first time in a long time. For being unattractive, he begins to criticize Olan as bored and unhappy he spends more time in town and visits the tea house where Cuckoo, the former concubine, works as a servant. A prostitute named Lotus becomes increasingly attractive to Wang Long while he is there. When he is with Lotus, he begins to lose touch with his family and only think about her. He buys her jewels and even gives her all precious land's pearls as a token of his affection. Other occurrences have an impact on the family's routine. Upon Wang Lung's uncle's reappearance, he and his wife and children move into the house. An unwelcome but cunning wife of Wang Lung's uncle assists Wang Lung in bringing Lotus to live in his home. Lotus maid, Cuckoo, is always by her side. This hurts so Lan, but she refuses to voice her displeasure. The domestic situation of Wang Lung becomes more and more complicated. As he discovers his oldest son has grown up. He concludes the arrangement for his son's future marriage to the daughter of a wealthy townie. Wang Lung is trying to get his uncle out of his house since he's become a nuisance. Wang Lung, on the other hand, learns that he is a member of a notorious gang. Wang Lung's uncle takes advantage of their relationship to get what he wants. Despite the passage of time, these unpleasant situations persist. Upon discovering that his oldest son, who has been pretending to be a scholar, but is actually pretty shallow, has been spending time with Lotus, Wang Lung banishes him to the southern provinces. Second son apprentices to a merchant, and second daughter promises to marry merchant's son's son. In the meantime, Olan has become very ill, despite her failure to draw attention to it. Wang Lung recognizes that he has ignored her when he sees her weakening. Seeing how sick she grows, he stays by her bedside, ministering to her needs as if she were his wife. Sometimes, Olan would shout out to her parents or talk in the manner of a terrified slave girl at the Huangs while she is sick or dizzy. The last thing she wants is to see her oldest son get married. Wang Lung calls the eldest son and makes plans for the wedding despite the fact that it will be one year earlier than originally planned. An extravagant ceremony takes place. 
Despite her weakened state, Olan is able to listen in from her room. After the wedding, Olan is found dead. After saying beauty will not bear a man's sons, she goes on to explain that her sons are heirs to her husband because she was unattractive. Several weeks after Wang Lung's father's death, Wang Lung's own father dies as well. During a joint funeral, both O Father Lan's and Wang Lung's father are laid to rest. To avoid seeing Lotus wearing the two pearls that Wang Lung took from O Lan, Wang Lung returns them to O Lan after the service. In spite of his continued success, Wang Lung is beset by a slew of domestic issues. The weight of the uncle and his wife is too much. Wang Lung's second daughter, in particular, appears to be a target for their son. As a solution to keep the peace in the family, Wang Lung sends her daughter to live with her future husband's family. Then, with the help of Cuckoo, he sets up his uncle and aunt to become opiumatics. They're no longer a problem once they've been heavily medicated. Their son is finally drafted into the military. However, there are further issues. When a family's finances improve, they experience a variety of improvements in their daily lives. The eldest son of Wang Lung advises that the family move closer to town because he is worried about his family's social standing. On hearing that the Huang house is available for rent, Wang Lung decides to move in with his family. It's a secret pleasure for Wang Lung to live in the old Huang mansion, which had long symbolized riches and prestige for him. In addition, he can get rid of his uncle and aunt who are still living in the old house. He gradually gets used to the more affluent city lifestyle. In one event in the novel, Wang Lung promises a gift to a local temple of his daughter and unborn law's kid as a boy. This shows how Wang Lung's life has changed. Soon after, a healthy grandson is born. A short time later, Wang Lung becomes concerned that he has betrayed the land's gods, and the death of Qing seems to confirm his suspicions. As an example of how the family is moving away from their farm, consider this seemingly insignificant event, Wang Lung agrees to teach his youngest kid to read. Wang Lung hesitantly agrees, even though he had hoped that at the very least the son would carry on the family legacy of farming. As Wang Lung ages and weakens, a succession of significant occurrences are triggered by one more unpleasant situation. The country is at war, and one day, a contingent of soldiers marches into town. In Wang Lung's new house, the uncle's son and his pals are camped out. The family decides to give him a woman instead of having him chase the household woman. Pear Blossom, Lotus's teenaged maid, is who he wants. Wang Lung is moved by the girl's protestations and gives the son another woman. The soldiers eventually leave. Pear Blossom still holds a special place in Wang Lung's heart, as does his eldest son. The relationship between father and son has been strained. In his restlessness, the young man contemplates joining the war for the liberation of his homeland. So Pear Blossom takes on the role of mistress in Wang Lung's household. The youngest son runs away from home when he learns of their relationship. Even though he doesn't communicate with his family, they learn later that he has joined a thing they call the revolution as an officer. Toward the end of his life, Wang Lung provides Pear Blossom an asphyxiant vial to be used on his mentally handicapped daughter after his death, so that she will not have to live in the absence of her father. A confession from Pear Blossom reveals the truth, she can't murder her and offers to raise the girl. Wang Lung's old age is depicted in the last chapters. He's aware that neither of his older boys has any discernment or regard for the land, and he's worried about their future. Indeed, there are indications that they intend to liquidate their father's investments. His two eldest sons agree to purchase him a casket when he thinks he is dying. Wang Lung has an odd sense of comfort when they do this. Wang Lung spends his final days returning to the farmhouse where he grew up, taking his coffin with him, and reminiscing about his history. Sons visit him and he overhears them discussing selling the land they own. That would be the end, Wang Lung declares, if they sell the land. Over Wang Lung's head, the boy's assurances that they don't intend to sell the land are understood. Wang Lung, a Chinese farmer who, at start, is exceedingly destitute but, by hard work and a little luck, grows richer and richer. In the beginning of the novel, he appears to be a simple, honest, and occasionally morally ambiguous man, but he is never completely evil or bad. He can also be apprehensive at times, until an event or circumstance prompts him to take action. Throughout the story, Wang Lung's healthy concern for his own and his family's stability becomes a drive to acquire more and more land, which ultimately leads to his downfall. The hard-working and cautious man can also be a bit of an artist, for instance, he never neglects his aged father but schemes to lead his uncle and aunt into an addition to opium. Particularly in his affections for Olan, Wang Lung can be cold and callous at times. 
he is clearly unaware of her resentment for Lotus and his relationship with the woman. Likewise, he doesn't notice her terminal disease until it's too late. Despite his wealth and age, Wang Lung's character continues to deteriorate. He begins to bow to his son's demands for a lavish display of riches and power, and he takes a young concubine in order to do so. He finally succumbs to old age and foolishness. Olan the wife of Wang Lung, was formerly a slave in the Huang household. O physical Lan's appearance is regarded unattractive by many. Wang Lung admires her not for her looks, but for her passion, strength, and willingness to put in the hours. In contrast to her husband, she is a self-starter who gets things done. Upon the arrival of the enemy, she joins the horde and loots the mansion of a wealthy citizen. Olan keeps to himself most of the time, but when he does speak, it's with unexpected wisdom. The turmoil in the city worries Wang Lung, so Olan proposes they wait for invasion rumors to come true. Even in the face of mental or physical agony, she does not show any emotion. Olan gives birth to her children all by herself, with no help from Wang Lung, and she does it while remaining silent about it. As Wang Lung's fortune develops, a gulf between him and his wife appears and widens. Olan, like a servant, continues to perform most of the household duties, even when he meets wealthy merchants in town and visits a beautiful tea establishment. Oh final Lan's years were harsh since she was forced to flee her own house by a concubine. Finally, in her dying days, she wants the best for her oldest son and wants to see him get married. Wang Lung's children, three sons and two daughters. Except for their birth order, the children in the story are referred to only by their positions, oldest son, second son, etc. The oldest daughter, who is mentally challenged, is affectionately referred to as poor fool. The sons don't share their father's passion for the land and regard him with little regard. The oldest son solely cares about his social standing. The second son's sole motivation is to make money. There is, however, a silver lining in the form of the family's youngest son. In response to his father's decision to make a concubine out of the lady he adored, he flees to help build a more free and just China. Lotus, Wang Lung's mistress. Wang Lung's household is the setting for Lotus narrative, which begins with her working as a prostitute in a tea house. Shrewd, selfish, and manipulative are just some of the adjectives that describe her. Lotus appears delicate, lovely, and seductive to Wang Lung when he first meets her. Nevertheless, as time passes, she becomes increasingly obstinate and demanding as she gets more confident in her power over him. When Lotus reaches old age, she becomes obese and indolent. Lotus is the only female member of the home after O death. Lance this, of course, suggests that Wang Lung's family is becoming progressively morally depraved. Cuckoo who is initially a slave to the Huang family and later a servant in the tea shop where Wang Lung meets Lotus, eventually becomes Lotus maid and, as a result, Wang Lung's servant. Cuckoo experiences several distinct phases and specialties throughout the course of the story. Eventually, she becomes Wang Lung's go-to person for advice and support in all of life's ups and downs. As Lotus's concubine, Cuckoo aids him in bringing her into the family and in devising the scheme to get his uncle and aunt hooked on opium. Because she serves as a bridge between the old methods of the Huang household and the contemporary ways of Wang Lung's household, Cuckoo is also meant to represent the corruption that exists in both of these households at the same time. Thank you for listening in Audiobook Academy. Don't forget to subscribe and smash that like button for more content like this. See you in next video. Mm -hmm.